Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you for praying. <clears throat> okay, we're going to turn a corner again. Um, so we are in week three right now of our series called Words to Nowhere. And the idea of this series is the fact that when we pray, and this is all about prayer, that when we pray, sometimes it feels like we're praying to the air. It feels like it's a one-way street. You ever feel like that in prayer? And so we're talking about how to pray better and how to have good prayer with God that's real and that's relationship. And today we're going to talk specifically about the words that come back to us and, and having God speak to us. And this is a it's a big, big topic. I want to tell you, um, we are in this 21 days of prayer and fasting, and last week we canceled more days than what we had for prayer. Um, it's just the way that it went. Welcome to Oklahoma, amen? Uh, welcome to Oklahoma. But uh, anyway, we're starting up again tomorrow, and one of the days that we had, God just kind of drove me to my knees, and, and for some of you, this is going to matter. I just need to say this to you. God kind of drove me to my knees, and he I believe, called me to pray a very specific prayer over this time and over you guys. Um, I believe what God started to say was that some of you have been waiting on an answer to prayer, and during this 21 days, he's going to give you that answer. That some of you have been stuck and in bondage, and this is going to be the time that he's going to bring breakthrough into your life. Um, it's going to be right now. And, and I want to call you to pray for that because I believe one of God's things that he does is he calls us to pray right before the miracle happens. And the reason he'll do that is because most of the time, 99.9% .9 of our lives, what are we doing? We're busy about trying to solve our own problems. And that's normal and that's human. What's what we should do? But when we stop everything and we finally surrender and we say, God, I don't have any more tools to fix this. And you finally come to him and say, it's got to be you. And you lay it down at the altar and you ask him to move. When you do that, often he moves. Because he knows that when he moves, you'll know who did it. You'll give him the glory he deserves. And our, our Lord is all about his own glory. And that's, that's a message for another day. But for the next 14 days, could I just encourage you, increase your expectations of what God is going to do in your life. I'm praying for you, and I'm praying for a list of testimonies to come out of this church. Amen? Amen. 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 So let's talk about how we hear God. This is John chapter 10. We have to start with the fact that you have the ability to hear God. John 10, this is Jesus talking. And he's going to set up this little uh, picture for us. Jesus loved parables, amen? He loved parables. And so he sets up this picture where he, he, he talks about a flock of sheep, and there's going to be a shepherd, and then there's going to be a gatekeeper. And the gatekeeper has, has been like keeping the sheep and protecting the sheep, and the gatekeeper is about to open up the gate to the good shepherd. Gatekeeper opens the gate for him, he says, and the sheep recognize the shepherd's voice, and they come to him. And he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And after he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him. Why? Because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. So Jesus establishes some things here that are absolutely critical. I could kind of end the sermon right here. If you're a Christian today, you have the ability to hear the voice of God. If you're a Christian today, you have the ability to discern Jesus' voice from all the false voices that are out there. Sometimes we think you've got to be a mature Christian. You've got to practice at this. You've got to pray and fast, and you've got to do all of these things in order to somehow, through a whole bunch of effort, try to acquire the voice of God in your life. It's not what he says. He says, you have the ability to hear God on day one of your salvation. If you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, not only have you been forgiven of your sins, not only have you been promised eternity with Jesus in heaven, not only have you been adopted into the family of God, but you've been given a superpower. Did you know that? 
You've been given the power to understand and hear and discern the voice of Jesus Christ. And he says even more, verse 27, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. He just describes what the whole life is like with him. He protects us and he loves us and he takes us ultimately home. I love that about Jesus. See, he does not have this expectation that for Christians, prayer is a one-way street. And some of you have been lied to that prayer is a one-way street. Nope. God wants to talk back. Mm Mm-hmm. Some of you are laughing because you're like, and I know I need it too. Right? All right, let's go into Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Beautiful story here. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now in those days, the messages from the Lord were very rare and visions were quite uncommon. So just really quickly, we're in ancient Israel at this point. This is the Old Testament. This is the old law. Jesus has not yet come. And so there's two characters in this. Eli is this really old high priest that had been been in charge of the temple. And then Samuel is like this 12-year-old boy. Scholars think he's about 12 at that point. So little guy, right? And here they are, and you're about to see what unfolds here. But let me just say real quickly, um, it says words from God, messages from God were really, really rare at that time. Now, that's the way the Old Testament worked. Only special people got a word from God. You had to be a prophet or a king or somebody special. And God might have spoken to you, but he didn't speak to anybody else, not the little people. It's not until the New Testament that he comes and says, Because of Jesus and because I'm going to pour out my spirit on all men, everybody's going to hear me. And he says all men, and he says all men and women, and he says the young and the old, they're all going to be able to hear the voice of God. And it was revolutionary because it's not the way that it used to work. And part of the reason for that is because Jesus forgave your sins and he made you clean because of his blood, not because of your efforts. And so we're not trying to be special, extra holy people who can hear God. We can hear God because we're sheep. Say, bah, bah, bah. All right, next. Um, One night, Eli who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed, and the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. I just love that picture, right? Like he wants to be close to God. And suddenly the Lord called out, Samuel. Yes, Samuel replied, what is it? And he thinks it's Eli. So verse 5, he got up and he ran to Eli the high priest. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. Where are the parents at? Go back to bed. Amen? Amen. I was sleeping. All right. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel. And again, Samuel got up and went to Eli, woke the old man up again. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, my son. Eli said, go back to bed. Now, verse 7, Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. Very, very important verse. What you get here is that Samuel, this boy, he knew God. He was a Christian. He loved God. He's trying to sleep near, as near the Ark of the Covenant as he can. So you see the heart that's in him, but he'd not gotten a message from God before. This just was an area of his Christianity he hadn't experienced yet. Many of us in the room today are exactly that way. We've, we've been saved, but we haven't done this thing yet that people talk about. People come along and they say, yeah, God told me blah, blah, blah. And you're thinking, that's a gift that I must not have. Right? We're going to talk about that. Um, Verse 8. So the Lord called the third time, and once more Samuel got up, went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? Then Eli finally realized that it was the Lord who was calling the boy. Verse 9. So he said to Samuel, go and lie down again, because now he knows what's going on. And if someone, he knows it's God, calls again, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And so Samuel went back to bed, and the Lord, of course, came and called us before. Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel replied, speak, your servant is listening. Here's what, it, what it encourages me here. God had called three times unsuccessfully. Samuel had missed him three times. Did God say three strikes and you're out? No. No. No, God initiated this conversation and God persistently kept following Samuel 
And I love that about God. And then the Lord said to Samuel, I'm about to do something shocking in Israel. And this is weird, okay? I'm going to carry out all my threats against Eli and his family. He says, from beginning to end, I have warned him that judgment is coming upon his family forever because his sons are blaspheming God and he hasn't disciplined them. You're like, well, that took a right, right turn. I know, right? He just gave a very difficult prophetic message to a 12-year-old boy to give to his boss. <laughs> Whew. Now, there's a whole backstory about all of that. Eli had been a faithful high priest in the temple, but he had not raised his kids in the right way. And they came into their role as pastors, and they thought that it was all about them. They thought it was about the money that they could make, and they did not honor God. And God had come in mercy to Eli and warned him, you got to deal with this. you got to deal with this. And sometimes parents are a little blind about their kids, are we not? And he didn't deal with it. And so this message from God is that God saying, I'm going to deal with it. But hey, read that on your own. That's not what we're talking about today. What we're talking about is that Eli gave this kid who's about to get the big message from God. And guess who's not getting the big message from God? Eli. Because he had grown stubborn and had stopped listening to God. So the message wasn't coming to him. But he still, in his kindness and in his wisdom, told this young person how to hear. Super simple. He said, all you do is you go and say, speak, Lord, because your servant hears you. Silence. Speak, Lord, your servant hears you. So this is essentially what needs to come into your prayer life. There needs to be moments of listening. Not You just don't talk to God one-way street but that you ask him questions, you let him know some of the pain in your life, and you say, speak, Lord, your servant hears, and then you wait. And that waiting part, super scary, super risky, super tough to do, right? Like, like it's in the waiting part, it's in the silence that maybe God won't speak, right? Maybe it'll prove that I'm not some super Christian like some of these other people are. And so that's a risky thing to do because the silence might be deafening. Not only that, but sometimes I sort of wonder where I won't really admit it to anybody, but I sort of wonder whether or not this whole Christianity thing is just me deluding myself about an invisible God who's not really there. Come on, somebody. And when I go and I say, speak, Lord, and he doesn't speak, Is it just an invitation for me to become even more deluded than I already was? We may as well say it. We're all thinking it. So it's a a massive moment of faith. And God is going to speak. And it's so simple. So, okay, rest of the message, I'm going to give you guys how to listen to God. And I'm going to give you a series of steps on that. And then I'm going to tell you how God will speak to you. I'm going to give you the different ways he'll speak to you. And then what are you supposed to do after he speaks? Because all three parts are super important. You ready for that? A lot of, a lot of Bible coming at you. First, listen to God with a humble heart. That's the first way that you listen. You listen to him with a humble heart. You don't just listen. The humility is key. The openness. The readiness to obey his voice. Sometimes the brokenness that we need to bring to God, that God, I've got no other way except you. All those things matter. Just creating that space of silence is so much. But listen to him with that very specific kind of heart. I remember the very first time that God spoke to me. It blew my mind. Not at all the way I expected it was going to happen. Right? People say, you know, God spoke to me. And I think it's going to be audible. It's hardly ever audible. Can I just say it? It's hardly ever audible. Some people have got a very specific gift and they'll, they'll get some really clear words from God. Praise God for them. But for the rest of us, probably not. Okay, God's going to impress something on us. Even in the scripture uh, with Elijah, so you guys remember this. The, the, remember the whirlwind comes to him and the earthquake and all this big loud stuff. And he says, but it was in the still small voice that I heard God. Do you see like a biblical writer trying to figure out a way to describe this thing? 
Sometimes Christians will talk about it like we get an impression from God or God led me. And I, I started to hear those things. It's like, okay, there's, there's a little bit more variety amongst God's people about this whole thing. So th the very first time I heard God speak, it went like this. I was out walking because that's how I pray. I'm a bit ADD. You can't let me be in my house. I'll just clean things and organize things. That's all I'll do. It, or I'll surf the web or I'll do something like that. But it's like, you got to get me away from it all. And I can just walk straight down the street and it just helps me focus. And I can talk to God like that. And, and normal Illinois, and I, I remember um, walking and praying, and I was going to try this thing. And, and if you could just imagine a sidewalk with like the concrete squares, right? Like I'm on this square, and I asked God this question. I don't remember what the question was that I asked God, but I asked it to him here. And about five or six squares down, I'd given him some silence, and all of a sudden a new thought came into my mind. And it was a thought that sent me down a road that I had asked him about back here. And I started thinking about it, and it wasn't about till square about 25, 35, that I'm like, hold on a second. Maybe this new train of thought was God responding to the question, and wait a second, what just happened? Did he just speak? That's how it happens. And sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes we talk ourselves into stuff, too. Sometimes it was the pizza we ate last night, right? Oh, God spoke. No. But it's like, but it's so simple. And there's, there's, a, there's a whole reason why he, like, builds deniability in, and he, he doesn't want to coerce our faith, especially when we're young and we're just getting moving and stuff like that. It's about boundaries, and it's about love and seeking him, and he does all of this stuff that I can't explain to you right now. But I'm just going to tell you that when you come to God and you say, speak, God, and then you create space and silence, he wants to speak. And he'll do it in a whole lot of different ways, just like he did with me. And it's like, and this, like it took me a while to figure out God had just spoken. The more I did it, the more I started to start, I started to get good at interpreting which pieces were me and which pieces were him. And it took a lot of practice, like a musical instrument almost. It just took a lot of practice to learn how to discern that stuff. And today, like I'm way more confident in telling you when I feel like God spoke to me and when he didn't. And I, I'm, just, I'm still getting it wrong sometimes, but I'm way more confident. Does that make sense? How do we come to God? Do we come to him with a humble heart? Next, hear him in the Bible first. I'll just make this one brief. There are some times that we want to come to God and we're like, God, I need you to speak to me on this question. And he's already spoken to you about it and it's in the Bible. And sometimes we're coming to the Bible and we're not following anything that's in the Bible in our lives. And then we come to God and say, now speak to me. He's not going to speak to you in your prayer life if you're ignoring him in your Bible life. Right? Right? There's a, again, there's explanation for why that's true. Next, quiet the competing voices. God doesn't yell. He whispers. It's just the way he is. He wants us to seek. He wants us to get quiet. And he wants us to quiet the world around us. And the reason he wants us to quiet the world around us is because the loudest voice is our own voice. It's our own agenda. It's what we're bringing. And he's trying to get us to Go quiet so that we can hear him. Pastor Dino Rizzo put it like this. We want God to turn up his voice. He wants us to turn down our lives. That's why we're fasting and praying right now. And you could increase that in your life too. Next, obey what he says every time. It's got to be a life pattern with you that you're obeying God. Because when he speaks to you, it's not so that you've got a cool story to tell people at parties. God speaks to you to direct you. He speaks to you so that you'll know how to follow him. And so if you're not following him, he's often not going to speak to you because you've already given him your stubbornness. It's the way that we are. When Eli decided to stop following God, God moved the word to Samuel. And that's a picture of us. 
So make it your habit to be obeying God every time. So how does God speak? Well, this is going to feel repetitive out of the Bible. It's number one. Out of the Bible. Look at this verse. So Matthew 19, verse 3. It says, some Pharisees came and tried to trap Jesus with this question. It's a question about divorce. It's so funny. They say, should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? Well, of course not. Why are you even asking Jesus this question? So Jesus responds, haven't you read the scriptures? The two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. The two are one. So why are you even asking me this question right now? Read your Bible. Let God teach you what his will is in all these things that are clear that we can't twist and distort, right? And and once you're doing that, then start asking him in prayer. But start with the Bible always. Next, listening prayer. Proverbs 3, 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Love this verse. It's like, God, I'm at a crossroads. I got right and I got left. Which one do I take? If you seek him, He'll show you which path to take. He wants to. Because he's trying to get this to be a two-way street. He wants you to ask. He wants to tell you. And then he wants you to walk and see it get confirmed. And then you're like, oh my gosh, the the Lord of the universe just spoke to me. It's, It's a real relationship now. Do you see what's offered to you? This is what he wants for you. He doesn't want church attendance and religion. Not what he's after. He wants this to be real, amen? Amen. And we're terrified to believe that maybe it could be real, but it can be real. God wants to speak. There was a guy, um, and I was in Illinois. I was doing this men's group, and um, we were doing Bible reading each day, and we were journaling it, soap journaling. We talked about that in the uh, uh, Rooted series. And so I had this group of men, might have five or six of them, and we were all journaling one chapter in scripture a day, and then we'd meet in a coffee shop once a week, and we would go over like one, like, hey, pick one of your journal entries from last week, and tell us what God's been doing in your life. And so this guy, Steve, decided to join, and he comes, and, and he's, a, he's a surgeon. I mean, he's, he's this brilliant guy. And he shows up and he tells us on the first day, he's like, just so you know, I don't believe any of this stuff. But my wife and I aren't doing so good. And she made me come to church. Don't say amen. I know you want to. He's like, and not only is she making me come to church, but she's making me come to this little class here. Okay. He's like, but I don't believe any of this. Okay. So we're all looking at each other like, what are we even going to do? God's going to have to do it. And so we start going weeks, and he's reading the Bible. And he's looking for the Holy Spirit to speak to him, even though he doesn't believe in a Holy Spirit. And he would just kind of show up and be like, well, this is the thing that was interesting to me. It's like, okay, great. And it went on week after week after week. And eventually he came this one day to the coffee shop, and his eyes were this big. And he's like, I got something to tell you guys. It's like, well, what, what is it? He said, he said, there was this one morning, and he's like, I'm reading, and this one verse kind of, that was the interesting verse to me, and I wrote it down. And not only was it interesting to me, but, but it had to do with my life. And he kind of told us the story, and there was a thing that he was facing, and that's it right there. He's like, but that's not the shocking part. The shocking part was that there was about three different people that approached me before I went to bed that night, and they all said the same exact words to me. He's like, what do I do with that? It's like, you know what to do with it, dude. So, so you don't even believe, and God spoke. And God proved to you that he saw your life. And he gave you exactly what you needed in your life. And then he knew your skepticism, so he decided to orchestrate you a miracle. And he had all these people come and say the exact same words. And we know from the the Old Testament that if a matter is established by two or more witnesses, it's established. And God did that as a miracle in his life. And I saw him become a Christian. 
So let's be done with all the theology of like we've got to do stuff in order for God to speak to us. I mean, like God will do his thing. God wants to do his thing. Amen? Amen. He wants to speak to you. I asked the staff this last week. I'm like, tell me about all the different ways God speaks to you because we're not all the same, right? Like some of us do get that like really, really clear message from God or you get that thing from like Steve had. Some of us like we get dreams and visions. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. We got some dreams and visions people here. God says he'll do that. We got some people here that's like, I get it all out of the Bible. That's all I ever think I ever get it out of, you know? Some of us get this impression. Some of us get words that form in our minds. And then we believe those words are from God. Some of us are so bullheaded, we don't get anything unless somebody tells it to us, to our face. Right? And I need that too. There's a lot of different ways that we get it in prayer, but God knows who you are individually, and so he'll come to you in the way that you need it. The way his voice speaks is different for you. There's people that like all they get from God is God will come in and say, I'm going to give you my presence, and I'm going to tell you that you are loved right now, and that can be enough. The scripture says that. Spirit, scripture says that he'll give us the Holy Spirit who will come and remind us that we are the children of God. Romans 12 says that God wants to come and he wants to transform our thinking. Some of you guys go into prayer on something and you're thinking about your fight in your marriage in a very particular way. And the answer from God is not going to be to deal with them. He's going to come in and transform your thinking as you pray. Let him do it. That's him responding to you. Does it make sense? All right, next is counsel. We also need wise counsel in our lives or advice. So the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Whoo, that should be in the school curriculum, amen? This is is life altering right here. We absolutely need good advice because other people, God has given them gifts and perspective and we need their perspective and we would be so much more wise if we listened to their advice. So there's some different people that you should listen to. Number one, Proverbs 15, talks about the multitude of counsel. And that's because you shouldn't just listen to that one friend on Facebook and what he has to say about it. Because he can mislead you. You need a multitude of godly, wise counsel, and you need to listen to what they're saying, especially on the big decisions. When Linda and I buy a house, we make a massive decision. We're going to pull three or four godly people in and say, I'm taking you out to coffee. I just want to get your perspective on this. I might feel like I heard God, but I'm just going to ask you to confirm. Make sense? What about listen to the church? God will sometimes give an authoritative confirmation or word through your church leaders, through your life group leader, through your Sunday school leader. And sometimes he'll give you a word from them that he won't give from anybody else because he wants you to realize it's from him. And then finally, listen to the authorities. Now, this is teachers, this is coaches, this is government leaders in your life. We are such a democratic society who's all about our politics and who we do and don't agree with. But the word of God says we should submit to our authorities. We should listen to them. That needs to get in our Christianity a little bit better in our generation than what it is. We're supposed to listen. Next, after wise counsel, circumstances. This one's really weird. Um, Has anybody ever said to you, you know what, I was stuck and I hated my job and then this new job opportunity came, came along and that was God opening a window. Anybody ever say that? God provided that. Or I was really, really lonely, and all of a sudden this person showed up, and that must have been God's chosen solution to all my loneliness in life. And internally you're like, I don't think so. (laughs) Like, I get it, but I don't. And this is what we do. We're trying to read the tea leaves here. We're trying to, like, see the circumstances in our life. And we keep pulling those things, and we're trying to interpret our circumstances at all times. This out of the four is the scariest thing. It's very, very risky. And I would question it. Because we can hear wrong. Amen? Amen. 
All the old Christians in the room said, amen. We can hear wrong. That's hard, isn't it? But it's true. We can misunderstand. I, I'm giving you Exodus 5, through 23 right there. There's this moment where Moses uh, goes to the burning bush. And do you remember when Moses is at the burning bush and God tells him, go in front of Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And then Moses does it. He obeys God. The whole situation's going great. And what does Pharaoh do? Do you remember? Pharaoh says, just because you said, of course, I'll let them go. No, it's not what he says. Pharaoh's like, how about they do bricks without straw today? I'm not even going to provide them the resources. The slavery that they're in, I'm going to make it even tougher for them. Take that, Moses. That's what he does. You ever obey God and have everything go bad? Sometimes it does. God doesn't guarantee that if you obey him, everything goes easy. And Moses is testimony to that. And you should, you should read Moses' prayer. He goes back to God. And he's like, I did what you said. I mean, it's this big, like, whiny session. It's like, and it didn't go right. And he's like, and you don't even care about your people. I mean, it's like he's accusing God of stuff. You're like, oh, you know. But it's real. Here's the problem. Moses is reading his circumstances. And he believes his circumstances reflect what the will of God is. You've got to be careful. Instead, what I would point you to is, is reading present circumstances is almost always super risky. Instead, look at past circumstances. You'll see all throughout the Old Testament, God would move in a massive way and they would build this altar to him. And it would be this marker for generations to come. And one of the things that you would see as, as the, the, the story of the Old Testament unfolds is that people would see God did this here and then he did this over here and then he did this over here and they would start to discern what the will of God was. They would start to see what he was doing in his people. That's an easier way to use circumstances than present. Okay, what do we do after we've heard God speak? First, believe. Sounds obvious. But we can respond to the words of God with skepticism, or we can live in a place of doubt, and doubt can be a difficult lens to live the Christian life through. And I'm not talking about doubt that's good. Can we just talk about doubt that's good and doubt that's bad? Doubt that's good is doubt that forces you to seek and find the answers to questions. That's good doubt. At Grace Fellowship Church, we like doubts. We like doubts that get you moving and finding things out with God. The bad kind of doubt is persistent, stubborn doubt that goes nowhere. It's just like, no, I just, last 10 years, I just live in this place of doubt. I just don't believe anything. Don't doubt the word of God when you've asked God to speak. Believe what he said in John 3, that, that the, the, the shepherd wants to speak to the sheep, and you have the ability to, to discern his voice, amen? So you got to come believing that. You've got to come expecting God to speak to you in that way. And that's powerful. And then next, you've got to confirm his voice. So this is, this is the opposite side. So i got to believe that God wants to speak to me. I've even got to expect that he will speak, and maybe that was him speaking. But I don't walk around to everybody and say, thus says the Lord. This is who's going to win the next election. Oh, I love them on YouTube. They're so fun, aren't they? Right, like so many people take the thus says the Lord as if like they know. No, like believe God wants to speak, but also confirm. Confirm his voice. You're responsible to confirm his voice because sometimes you can get it wrong. Sometimes it is the pizza that you ate last night, not the voice of God. It totally is, right? Or it's what, what, more often it's, it's your agenda that you're kind of trying to slip in there. I'm kind of talking myself spiritually into something right now. I'm like, we do that kind of thing. Wait, doesn't God talk perfectly? Yes, but our ears are imperfect. Somebody grab your ear right now. Come on. These guys, they got issues. Right? They do. It's like, I was so sure until I sat down with this really wise person who showed me the Bible. And then I wasn't so sure anymore. You got to confirm it. 
And you confirm it in these ways that aren't so easy to be manipulated, like going back to Scripture and getting wise counsel. But confirm the things that God tells you. 1 John 4, 1 says, Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit on YouTube, that they have come from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. Last, obey his voice. God does not speak so that you will be impressive or have a story to tell. God speaks so that you'll obey. God speaks because he wants you to move. And when God talks to you, he's almost always asking you to move a particular direction. It's your opportunity to follow him. That's what Christians are, right? We are those that follow Jesus. Talk about this relationship, how it's two-way. God wants to help you walk the path more carefully. And he wants you to walk the path in your specific life the way that he wants you to. And sometimes we get off. Do you ever get off the path? And a lot of times what he's telling you is how to get back on the path. So let him and obey him when he does. Deuteronomy 30 says, It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it. This is Moses speaking. He's talking about God's word. And he's saying you don't have to be super spiritual people who know how to climb all the way up into heaven and get God's word. Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it. No, the word is near you. It is already in your mouth, and it is in your heart, so you may obey it. The word is near you. God, God speaks to you, and it's near you. Say near me. Near me. Near me. It's, it's right here. Not far away. See, this is about relationship. This whole prayer series is all about relationship. It's all about you loving God for real and not being a religious person. And this is such a massive step that you would start to take these risks and start to hear God speak to you and start to trust it and start to walk it out. And then you're thrilled at the, at the, at the thought that he would speak. I don't know how many times he's spoken to me in my life. Not enough. I'll take more. I want to hear him. And every time I hear him, I know how loved I am. I know how much of a son I am. It's about a love relationship. So I'm going to close with a story that at first I'll warn you is not going to feel like it's got anything to do with this message. But there was a woman telling me this story. She was having a conversation with two other ladies. And she's a believer. They weren't believers in Jesus. And somehow the conversation came up of like, well, would you die for your faith? Which is kind of a Christian thing, right? Would you die for your faith? Like somebody's going to come and hold the gun up to our heads tomorrow. And so they're having this conversation. And before... Before the Christian lady even answers the question, one of them kind of groans, does this sigh thing, gets this look on her face like, what an idiotic thing to say. And it's like, can't you relate to that? Like, it makes sense. Like, to her, this Christianity thing isn't real. So what is it? It's a philosophy. It's a philosophy. Nobody's going to die for a philosophy. Right? Like, we don't suffer for isms, right? Like, we've all got our isms. We've got all our influencers and our things, but we're not going to die and suffer for them. Not really. And somebody talks like that, it's just, you know what? Over dramatic people having over dramatic ideas is kind of how it feels. So, are we there? And she tells me, she's like, you know what? When that lady responded that way, she's like, it's like, I, I get it and all. She's like, but it just hurt me. It hurt. Not offended, 
Not like I'm this super brittle, super touchy person. Not angry. She's like, it just hurt. Why did it hurt? And I start probing her. I start asking her questions like, you got to tell me why. You got you to explain what was going on inside of your head. And, and you know what started to come out? Is it's like, I can tell you all these things that God has done in my life. The time he spoke to me in this worship service. The time he saved me from this. And the time I heard this thing out of his word. And he rescued me over here. And all this stuff that had gone on all in her life. And what she was describing to me was somebody that loved God. And, and she loved God because God had loved her. And it was real. And she didn't even know why she was hurt in the conversation. Do you get it? But she was hurt because the miracle had actually happened in her. It was actually a natural response because you won't die for an ism, but you will die for someone you love. And see, it had crossed this line for her. It wasn't church attendance anymore. The word is near you. The word is near you. And God wants to speak into your life because he wants to turn it upside down and take you into a place where it's actual relationship. Because many of us would have walked into that conversation and we would have gotten all hung up on what, whether, whether we would die and pass the test and all that kind of stuff. You don't know. Neither do I. But man, I hope I would. Because I love him. Yes? It's love. All right, it, would you guys stand? Let's pray. Jesus, we want to love you more. And we want to be loved by you better. And I pray that we would start to create space for that to happen. God, would you come in and would you just practically start building that into our lives? God, more prayer with you. Help us not to get intimidated. Help us to build space for listening, to just let you speak. God, I pray that you would start to work that into the lives of so many, God, even online. And God, those listening in this room right now, Lord, I pray that you would start to build that real two-way street relationship. God, it's supernatural. And Lord, we want that. And Lord, when we, when we show up with you, would you show up with us? And God, where we really need answers, God, would you give us those answers, Lord? I pray for, I pray, Lord, just for a, just an outpouring of miracles all across this church so that, God, it would build up our faith and that we would know you mean business by all this. We are your sheep, and we can hear your voice. We love you, Lord. In Christ's name, amen.